Well, welcome back, everybody, uh, and welcome to the keynote stage. We're getting ready for our next session here, which is a great Q&A between ASI President and CEO Tim Andrews and Jeremy Lott, President and CEO of Sanmar. Sanmar is an apparel powerhouse that's won numerous awards and accolades for its product quality and customer service. Just It was just named Halo's Supplier of the Year, and with estimated sales of $2.4 billion, it's certainly a uh, one of the largest, if not the largest company in the industry. Um, and Sanmar has grown by leaps and bounds since Jeremy Lott took over as company president in 2013, before also adding the title of CEO two years ago. In 2020, he was ranked number one on our prestigious Counselor Power 50 list. I certainly can't wait to hear what Jeremy and Tim have to say about this extraordinary period that we're all living in today. If you have any questions for Jeremy, please use the stage chat to submit, and Tim will ask as many as he can at the end. Be sure you click the stage chat, not the event chat. Uh, that event chat goes to everybody. The stage chat is for those listening in here. So please make sure to do that. Um, any audio problems like uh, echoing or feedback, close any other hop-in tabs in your browser except for this keynote tab, and you should be good to go. Okay, everybody, please welcome Tim Andrews and Jeremy Lott. Guys, take it away. Great. Thank you, Andy, very much. Jeremy, apparel powerhouse. I like that. How does that sound? <laughs> sounds sounds, uh, sounds pretty good. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll take it. Sure. Well, thanks very much for joining us on this very first ASI show, Digital Expo. Uh, let's jump right in. Um, let's start with, you know, where are you? Where are you working from these days? Yeah, well, for, well first, of, Tim, thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here. And Andy, thanks for the nice uh, introduction. I am uh, at my house. I live on a small island just east of Seattle, um, and our offices are about uh, in, in a, some called, a city called Issaquah, about 10 miles east of Seattle. So I'm five miles from my office, uh, but working out of my home where I've been really since March. Great. You know, uh, I, I've always marveled that Sanmar had been uh, using work at home for, for years. You know, I, mean, I, know I know your customer service uh, reps and your sales reps, I've, I've talked to you about that before. And you were way out ahead of, of almost all of us in that regard uh, before all of us you know, sort of had to all start working from home with COVID. So, so when and why did you start moving to home officing uh, and, and work? And, and you know, what did you learn about that uh, you know, earlier that helped you during the pandemic? It really started you know, maybe even 15 or so years ago. The, the Puget Sound region where Seattle's in was growing exponentially. The, it was, um, it was hard to uh, recruit and retain kind of really good people. And we would have somebody and they would leave and we would do an exit interview. And the number one reason why they were leaving the company was uh, commute. They, you know, they were driving an hour, they get a job closer to home. And we said, gosh, you know, we've got to be able to solve this because we invest so much in our people and the relationships they have with the customers. When we leave, it's just so disruptive for us. And so, we put together this pilot program of, we called it at home. And we took some of our account executives who'd been with us for you know years. We knew they could, we could put them anywhere and they would work fine and um, figured out the technology piece and kind of set them home and, and it worked. And we then sent home another class and another class and another class. And um, I think what we found over time was we had to be, the technology was evolving fast enough that that all made sense. Um, it, the we had to be good at things like distance training and education, things that we hadn't done before. It is a different skill to train somebody who's sitting in your office. Um, you know, you're sitting next to a buddy and you're seeing how they're doing work together than to train remotely. And so that was a skill set and that we really had to kind of build internally, I think, around how to communicate and how to train. Those first classes, we said, you know, you had to live, I think it was 30 miles from our office so you could come in. We had this vision that they would come in frequently. Over time, we realized it just really wasn't necessary. And so now it's opened us up to hiring people in any of the states where we have a physical presence. So we have account executives in Florida and New Jersey and Texas, and and we hire and and train them and manage them. And, and they're part of the team, just like if they were in our offices, but they're there. And so having those skills has really, really helped as we've transitioned kind of through this year because we didn't have to figure out how to work at home. We kind of knew how to do that. 
Um, and in March, when we closed our offices, it was pretty easy for us to send everybody home. And, and how have you over the years learned uh, to, to make sure that the culture is consistent across all of those individuals? For, for someone like ASI, you know, we have 450 employees outside Philadelphia. We found ourselves all working from home and, and lots of other companies in this industry, whether you have two employees, whether you have 500 employees, are finding that uh, that cultural piece is, is interesting to, to try to make sure that you, you maintain that culture, especially as you're hiring new people and onboarding them. So how have you, how have you approached that? You have to be really um, thoughtful about how you talk about culture, how you communicate culture, how you kind of experience it. Um, so it starts for us through a hiring process. You know, we use uh, a lens that is very culture driven to think about who the people are that are going to be good fits at Sanmar. Um, through our onboarding, we're doing uh, videos. I'm speaking to our new sales classes. My father speaks to our new sales classes. The trainers that we have are really steeped in our culture and our values. We have stories that we tell. So we have certain stories that we think are just kind of seminal Sanmar stories that we use to kind of tell the, the, the history of Sanmar, the culture of Sanmar. You can't work in our company and not know the yellow t-shirt story or the FedEx story. We have these stories that we've told. And so over time, um, but that's really helped us transition the culture, even though, you know, we're not physically kind of together. Um, and then we do this, we have, you know, we were doing a lot of this type of video conferencing and chatting and, and we do group huddles. You're still part of the team, even though we're kind of remote and we're very purposeful about um, what are our values? Here's the things that we believe in. Here's our culture. How do we transmit it to people? And then how do we maintain that by um, really, being together even if we're not kind of physically together we've tried to do a lot of fun things this year as much as we can i know a lot of companies have so we've done you know where you're online and we're painting a picture together or you're making meals or you're making cocktails or you're doing a happy hours i mean we've um, as best we could tried to do as many of those things to maintain the sense of camaraderie and teamship that we had you know when we were together um you know even though we're all apart that's great well, you know, we just released our 2020 uh, industry sales estimate and early on in the pandemic, I think uh, a lot of us really feared that sales were going to be off as much as 35 or 40 or 50 percent. Uh, but thanks really to the stronger than expected sales and PPE, which of course was, was really a hero in 2020 for our industry at least. Um, sales we estimate in 2020 were off about 20 percent across the board, uh, including PPE sales, which were really tremendous. Um, you know, what, what do you think, uh, you know, what do you think about those numbers and, and, you know, how did Sanmar really fare in 2020 and sort of, as you look at 21, what, what are your predictions for the industry? You know, I think it's, um, so when I think about the industry only, you know, being down 20%, considering how much of what we sell to is around live events and, and business travel and conventions and all the things that we know about, I think it's a tremendous success for the industry. I, I am, um, you know, like everyone else, when um, for us, it was the night the NBA stopped playing. I mean, you remember there was like two teams that were about to get on the court. And they like kind of pulled them off the court and our sales just dropped like off a cliff the next day. And we're down, you know, 75, 80 um, percent. And, you know, that was a scary time. Are we going to come back? What does that look like? Um, you know, are customers going to stay in business? Are we going to stay in business? You know, all, all of those things. And two things really happened in my mind that were really exceptional. I think that um, the, 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 the pivot to PPE and the way our customers moved to that was really an exceptional thing to watch. I mean, it was so impressive for me to see all of these businesses say, how can we still be really relevant to our customers who don't need you know, the regular products we sell? That was an extraordinary thing that happened. Um, I, I don't know if we give it enough credit, I, 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 the, but it was really extraordinary. And then what we do in normal times, that product really came back. And I think what it showed was actually the value of what our industry brings and how important our industry is. And we saw that in a really significant way at the end of the year. It was more important than ever to thank your employees, to thank your customers, to thank your vendors. The level of holiday gifting that was happening was really at a level that we haven't seen people, the, the need to connect your employees when they weren't together um, was so intense. And our products and our industry played such a huge piece of that. So at Sanmar, we were sending out 
t-shirts that said we got this that had all the cities that have samr locations on and everybody in the company is wearing the t-shirt and we're all on the zoom together kind of wearing it and taking the pictures like and we weren't the only ones who were doing those things so many companies were doing those things our products were critical in helping companies connect people and so it for me it, it became really a um a reaffirmation of what we do as an industry and the value that we bring. And I think our industry showed up big time this year and really showed that. And that's what gives me just so much optimism, I think, about the future. Um, and when I think about the industry in the future, how we're going to do. You know, at Sandler, we were, we had, um, you know, we were really fortunate to get two cover government contracts with the federal government to make um, masks. We were part of a coalition of U.S. textile companies um, with Hanes Brands and Fruit of the Loom and Beverly Knits and a couple others that early on um, the, the government wanted to have a um, an American-made uh, supply chain for masks when there was a huge kind of shortage. And it was really an amazing experience. We went from never having made the masks before to eight days later we were in production to eventually delivering 250 million masks just at wow. Sandler to the federal government. Amazing. Um, and then our business really came back from those depths that we were in in March to, um, you know, we were uh, had our best December that we've ever had um, and we're up significantly over last year. Now, that came with huge challenges and I'm happy to talk about some of those, but um, we finished the year really strong. So again, we feel really optimistic about uh, about this year. So what were some of those challenges? Well, I think, you know, if I showed you a graph of how our sales went over the year and then we were doing fine and this huge drop and then this kind of comeback and it flattened over the summer and then this really nice, a really significant increase into the fourth quarter. Um, at each opportunity, we're, at each point in time when we had to make decisions, we were making decisions with the best data that we had at the time. So, you know, we're looking, here we are in, in March and we're looking at a spreadsheet that says, well, the, maybe the business isn't gonna survive this year. It, you know, our inventory is gonna go up, our sales are gonna go down and we might run out of cash. So what do we need to do? We need to cut expenses, we need to stop ordering, we need to do all of these things to kind of triage this um, business that, that this year is celebrating 50 years that's so valuable to my family and to me. And, and so we had to make some hard decisions uh, but we did decide as a company, we didn't lay anybody off. We did cut people's salaries. We cut people's hours. Um, we went out to our vendors and we said, we need to help. We need you to partner with us, but we are not going to cancel any orders that we have. We took and paid for on time every order um, that we had placed. That was uh, quite unusual in the apparel world. Most apparel vendors, most apparel brands that you know went to their vendors and said, don't ship it if you, I'm not paying for it, you know, and we took a very um, different approach, but we still had to, again, make some hard decisions. Um, as the business got better and as we got into the summer, we realized that we could bring people back. We brought everyone back full time. We brought their salaries back. We started ordering again, but when our business was down 30%, um, you know, and there's no live events happening, there's no conferences happening. Uh, we knew we weren't going to see you in Orlando in you know January. You know we were thoughtful about like what are what do our orders look like? What does our inventory kind of plan look like? Um, and then as we got into September and really our business kind of ramped up significantly to being up you know quite a bit in December. Uh, you know we couldn't react enough to um, put our inventories in line with with kind of what those sales were. And so when you have lead times that span from you know four months to a year, it's very difficult to react quickly to an environment that it's changing so fast. And so that was the world we found ourselves in. We were trying to stay open every day across our DC network. We, may, we had days where we had 80 people in one warehouse out on some sort of a leave. They either had COVID, they were exposed to it, they had a, they had a someone in their household had it. Um, we had uh, a few employees who passed away from COVID. So um, how we maintain safe workplaces, how we stayed open, how we managed inventory, um, how we managed staffing, 
you know, we weren't hiring because we had thought we were going to be significantly overstaffed. We were wrong. We were short staffed into the year. That was very difficult for our internal sales team. So I'm hiring aggressively right now um, and, uh, and trying to build things back up. And we did an ERP implementation in May, which was really challenging. It continues to be challenging for us. So uh, it was a really, really hard year with um, uh, with a lot of kind of different challenges kind of throughout. But I'm really proud of our team and how we came together and how we uh, have done everything we can to service as best we can in a really tough environment. Well, congratulations. I mean, that's an incredible story from from the performance overall from a financial perspective, but also that that turning. And I agree with you on on the industry point. You know, I think we haven't really given ourselves enough credit for saving lives. You know, distributors and suppliers changed their business models completely. As you said, we sourced product we had not sourced before. If I had said to you in a hallway, well, you would probably have known this, but if I, if I had said to most people in a hallway in Orlando uh, in January of last year, PPE, and it's 20 bucks, you can tell me what it stands for. My, my guess is I would have probably got to keep my 20 bucks. Um, so, um, so, so, so is, P, is PPE here to stay? We think it probably did five or $6 billion in this industry uh, mm -hmm. through the, the network uh, over the course of 20, 20. Um, so what do you think about PPE uh, as as it stands, you know, with the traditional product? And then I also want to get into your announcement this week about about healthcare scrubs. Before we get to that sort of PPE in general, what do you think it's going to play, you know, in 21, 22? You know, I think that when I um, when I would travel to Asia, uh, you would see a lot of people wearing masks. It's just kind of a normal part of kind of the culture. This is pre kind of COVID. And in the United States, it really wasn't at all. I mean, we if you were, you know, uh, sick and you had a cold in Hong Kong two years ago, you were wearing a mask on the MTR. Like we didn't do that here. Um, I think two years from now, um, you're going to see people on the subway in New York wearing a Mets mask. I think it's just going to be a normal piece of kind of what we do. And so I think that as we think about being more health conscious, and I think COVID has just raised a lot of these things to um, a greater level of consciousness for us. I think PB is here to stay and in a bigger way than it was historically. That said, I don't think it's what it looks like in 2020. I don't see that huge, um, you, you know, kind of rush again. And, and God willing, we're kind of past this and we all don't need to wear masks every day or two masks every day or whatever they're telling us to wear today. But it's, um, uh, you know, so we see at Sanmar at least that masks will be an ongoing, it'll be something we sell. It'll be a small category, like we sell aprons or towels or some of these other smaller accessory categories we're in. We don't see it being a huge piece of our business going forward, um, but I do think it'll be around and it'll be part of the industry going forward for sure. It's great. So, so this week you announced a, a partnership with Wonder Wink uh, to offer uh, world-class healthcare scrubs. So uh, I think this is the part. This is the first entrance you've had in the healthcare apparel space, or specifically the healthcare space. How did it come about, and, and how do you see that playing, especially with the distributor network that's that's watching today? So we've been looking at um, kind of healthcare apparel for a long time and trying to figure out what was the right way to do it. Was it with our own, building our own brand? Was it to partner with somebody? We've looked at partnerships before with other companies um, and, and just really felt like there is a market that is being really underserved here today by the traditional healthcare apparel companies and the way they go to market and their normal chain. They, they really were turning away our customers and, our, and, and they really didn't want to work with distributors. Our, their customers saw that as competitive. Um, and so what I think is there's this huge market. If you think about things like um, certainly things like nursing homes or, or um, you, know, you know, even like senior clinics or veterinary clinics or dentist offices or you know, somebody gave an example of their mobile, they're selling to a mobile pet grooming clinic, you know, the person who comes to your house, you know, more and more of those people are wearing scrubs and a lot of them want them decorated, you know, and I, I run the mobile pet grooming clinic and it says, you know, Jeremy's pets and it's embroidered on my scrub. Our customer absolutely can be a big piece of selling to those people. And it's different than the traditional medical apparel brands and how they're going to market. And so, you know, we started conversations with um, Wonder Wink and, and, and really found that there was a really good fit between the product that they're making, which is at the better end of the scrub market. It's not the disposable scrubs that they are wearing in an operating room, but it's at kind of that better end of the market. It's what the woman who works at the, your dental hygienist wants to wear. Um, 
And so they make a better scrub. They understood our channel. They weren't servicing it well. And so we're, we're excited about the, the partnership with them. I think it'll be a really nice growth opportunity for us and for our customers, a product that they've really had a hard time sourcing uh, that they'll now have great access to. And how big is that market, you think, that it could be really addressable by our distributor network? I mean, I think we've learned one thing that our distributor network that in this industry can really, you know, sell things they, they never knew about before. So in an ideal world, how, how big a market does that become for Sam R and for the distributors? You know, we think it can be a pretty significant kind of market. It's a little bit hard um, for me to give a great estimate today. But if you told me that, if, you know, distributors were selling $500 million of medical apparel, that wouldn't surprise me at all. I mean, I think it can be a pretty significant market. And I think it's a very, uh, it's a growth market. I mean, more and more people are wearing this product as part of their job. I think some of that has to do with an aging population and, and everything that looks like. Um, this was a market that was growing dramatically pre-COVID, and I think obviously that's accelerated the need for medical apparel, but I think it, this is not a COVID-specific uh, play of Sanmar. This is really that we think more and more people every year are going to use this as their uniform, and we're in the uniform business, and our customers are in the uniform business in a really significant way, and so I think that's the why we think this makes a lot of sense. Great. And, and speaking of uniforms, obviously, and you mentioned this uh, related to sports, you know, obviously that is a huge market for apparel in our space and very important marketplace for the distributors. You know, um, none of us can really predict, I guess, when that's going to come back. But but, you know, what's your what's your best sense of that? You know, what what do you what are you seeing across the across the U.S. in terms of of sports events? And and as that sort of comes back, you know, what are you expecting? You know, so one of the things that's been really interesting this year, uh, very different than 09, from a recession standpoint, in 09, everything got uh, hit and it got hit. We, we start selling expensive things and people traded down to less expensive things. This this kind of recession, I'll think of it, you know, more than the pandemic has created winners and losers in product category. So I can't give away, you know, dress woven shirts right now. It's very difficult to, to sell them um, because people aren't putting them on and going to the trade show and exhibiting. I mean, all those things that we would normally sell to. Uh, sports has gotten hit harder than some of our other categories because so mm -hmm. much of that live sports, and we sell mostly, we think of as fan wear. So, you know, you're at the high school football game on a Friday night and you're with 3000 people on the stands and it's a community event and we're all wearing, I live on Mercer Island, we're all wearing Mercer Island sweatshirts. You know, that hasn't happened. Um, we're, we're betting um, pretty significantly that in the fall, you're going to see a pretty robust, we think high school youth sports kind of mm -hmm. come back. We think it's going to come back through the summer. I have, I have six kids, five of them who are um, uh, still in the house and are and play youth sports. So I know how important it is to my kids. And we're just starting here in Washington state to kind of open some of those things back up again. I know my friends who are parents and their kids, how important kind of youth sports is. And so you know, I think you'll see more camps this summer. I think you'll see sports start to come back. And I really think they come back in the fall in a pretty significant way, because I think that we just as humans and, and as a society, like are really missing and craving the level of kind of connection and community that I think sports does a really good job of, of bringing. It's not so much to me around, you know, watching the game. It's really about being there with my community and being part of something. And I think that that um, I'm bullish on that coming back. Um, we're planning inventories like it's going to come back in a significant way. So we're hopeful. Yeah, they, they, you know, I'm, I'm certainly hopeful. I think we saw that yesterday on the platform here. You know, we had over 6,500 distributors uh, yesterday and watching the interaction and the chatting and the videos and the connectivity, people are really aching, I think, to get back together. And so we're excited about maybe, you know, seeing a lot of people who are here, you know, in our Chicago show in July. But, um, you know, your planning, you know, has got to be so far in advance for inventory that, that you know, uh, my fingers are crossed for you, too, and for, for all of us that that all comes true. Yeah. Um, you. you know, I know that, that Sam, you mentioned ERP upgrade um, a few months ago, and, and there were some challenges there. And, and certainly, you know, Sam has one of the very best sterling reputations for customer service in the industry and, uh, and in the world, really, outside of even our, our slice of the economy. Um, you know, sort of how did that go and, you know, what's what's happening and is it all where you want it to be? And, and you know, what's the what, what 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 were the lessons out of that? Yeah. So almost four years ago now, we made the decision that we had a um, homegrown ERP system that was really 19, 
like 1970s almost technology. It was green screen. It, it was, it worked incredibly well, but it was not something that we could sustain, we thought, into the future and not something that could bring um, the level of uh, change that we needed uh, to, to make to the business. So we started a process of um, looking at a new ERP. We knew how hard that process would be. We, at our scale of a company, you, you really only have a few options mm -hmm. that really kind of meet your business. You're looking at SAP and you're looking at Oracle and you know Microsoft and Infor. And um, we picked Microsoft's Dynamics 365 um, they had completely rewritten what was Dynamics AX for the cloud. Um, the, the, we're in Seattle. The, the Dynamics team is very close to us. We, they really said, we want you guys to be a showcase account for us, Sanmar. We're going to bring our other customers in. You're going to have really high level attention from us. And so we made the decision to go with Microsoft and, and their platform and spent really three years doing an implementation that was a two-year project that took three years that cost double what it was supposed to cost. Um, and we actually were planning to go live at the end of last year to the point where I have in our offices like a hundred sleeping bags that we bought because we knew everybody would be like spending the whole weekend, you know, in the office. Uh, but we, we were, we ended up going live the weekend of May 4th. We did it all over Teams. Um, I spent the whole weekend just watching this, these, the conversation happening. It was fascinating because I, I, I can't really help, but I was there and um, it, we did it and we went live. And our goal was, we knew there would be challenges, but our goal was we need to take and ship every order we get that day. Mm. And we did that. Every order we took that, that day, we shipped that day. Um, there were several orders that we didn't charge people for. We had problems processing credit cards, but we shipped their order. We, um, and it's been a it's been a, it's been a challenge. And I think the thing that I um, when we first met with all these technology vendors, I said to them, I said, you know, we're not doctors, so people don't die, you know, in our business. But there are T-shirt emergencies, and uptime and availability is so critical to everything that we do. Um, and you know, everybody is, gives a promise. It, it has been a, it has been a very uh, it's been very challenging. It's been challenging for our team. It's been uh, we've asked for a lot of patience and grace for our customers as we've learned the new system and we've had problems with it. Uh, we've had performance problems where the system will slow down for different reasons. Um, we've had, uh, you know, I, I mentioned earlier on a credit card problem. We've had problems with collecting tax in the appropriate way. I mean, we have had several problems. Um, I have a weekly call with the Microsoft team that's still very engaged. I have a every other week call with the chief operating officer of the union Microsoft responsible for all of their corporate applications. So all of Azure, all of ERP, all of like, um, and, and so we are, we have, I think the right level of attention at Microsoft. It is our number one priority at Sanmar to get it where we need to be. But some of these things are just uh, really challenging you know, through that all, you know, we still had our biggest December ever and shipped every order that we took. So we are absolutely in business taking orders. Um, but we've, we've had, uh, it, it has not been an easy process. Uh, and I'm, and I, and I really am thankful for our team, especially our frontline account executives who have had to learn a new system that is not ideal. And I appreciate the patience and grace that our customers have given us as we've um, made this transition. You know, it's amazing. In some ways, um, all the companies in our industry, I think, are turning into technology companies. And uh, in your case, it's a technology and inventory business and inventory planning business. Um, but so, technology is so important. All of us, we're, we're actually thinking about a new ERP platform at ASI. So, so I, I, I'm going to probably call you up about some of the some of the challenges. So I, we don't we we at least try to stay away. We, we, there's been a lot of uh, ERP upgrades in the industry in the last uh, six months, and um, I think a lot of challenges in all those companies. Um, let, let's sort of shift to, to something else in technology that's really important to all of us, which is you know sort of cyber attacks. There's been some really big uh, names in the industry that have that have been attacked in various ways with with cyber uh, problems. Um, you know, people are so sophisticated now and so organized in cyber criminals. Um, and of course, you have a lot of information that's very valuable to the distributors and to their buyers. Uh, private, you know, very important uh, information that they have, and especially you know um, in this in this time, I think one thing we learned is that our customers really trust us more than maybe we would imagine. You know, we have 
companies giving the, the home addresses of their employees to distributors who then turn them to suppliers because they're doing drop ship programs as an example, like as you were describing. So sort of what's Sandler's efforts around that data protection and cyber protection and, and what can you share with, uh, with, with distributors about that who are really concerned about that? You know, I think when I go back, you know, 10 years, maybe we, we thought about PCI compliance and credit card data, you know, that was our key. And so that's like kind of, there's a mandated level of, of encryption and process that we had to have because of the level of, you know, on a credit card transactions that we had. Mm -hmm. um, and so we stopped, you know, we were really careful about what information we stored and we don't store credit card information and we don't, you know, there's a lot of things that we kind of don't have today that we did maybe 10 years ago because of some of the PCI pieces. But I was sitting at the Power Summit in 2019 and heard Norm Hollinger from Alpha Broder talk about their, um, you know, cyber attack. That, and, you know, my first call, of course, was to our CIO saying, well, do we have cyber insurance and let's talk. And it was an interesting way of call. And I've actually thanked Norm for being so open because we, um, we put in place, we didn't have the right level of, of cyber insurance before that. Um, and uh, last year I got an email it looked like a, um, a a vendor was sending me like something that was a QuickBooks um, bill to pay. Huh. I have like you know a gardener that uses QuickBooks to send me kind of bills, and I was moving really fast, and I clicked on it, and then I realized uh, I don't know who that person is who just sent me this bill, and I and I quickly sent the email to our team, and I said I just clicked on this, and they said okay, they started watching, and then. Um, they saw that my computer was pinging Bulgaria mm -hmm. and they um, they took my computer off the network. They actually, I, I said, well, can you just clean it? They said, no, no, we're going to, like they recycled it, completely kind of destroyed it. But um, we put in place something called uh, carbon black, I think is what it's called. And it basically sits on every node in our network. And this was what the cyber insurance came in and did. Mm -hmm. um, and watching to see, make sure that there was not any more of kind of this ransomware because it's such, it's so prevalent. It is a truly a business for these kind of criminal gangs. Um, and of course I was the one who clicked on the bad email. And so we were really fortunate that we had um, Kroll, who's the company that helped us and put this in place. And that was because of the cyber insurance. And frankly, it was, uh, we would not have been there had, had you know, I not have learned from 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 Norm and his openness, so I really appreciate uh, that that willingness to share. Um, and so, you know, of course, now you would think I was like completely in tune to the emails that I'm getting. And like a week later, I got an email from Netflix. I thought it was from Netflix saying that like I needed to re-put in my password. And so uh -huh. I did that. And then they asked me for my social security number, and I was like, oh my gosh, I did it again. So. You know, I, I, um, that one didn't affect Sandler at all, but I was like, had to, you know, all of a sudden, then somebody's logging into my Netflix somewhere else. And I had to re change my password. The, the people who are doing this are so sophisticated. And the fact that I could be tricked twice in a short period of time maybe speaks more to me than anything else. But they, it was, we've done a lot to try to train our people and to give them the, all of the kind of training on what to, what emails to click on and what not and what to look for in these things. At the same time, it is a really difficult world because these these criminals have gotten so sophisticated, and you just have to you have to have personal vigilance, and then you have to do a really good job to have the right things in place to if you if you click on that email you shouldn't have. And I highly recommend um, the right levels of cyber insurance, not just because of the dollars that they pay, but because the expertise that they bring in um, if you have a problem. Great. Well, let's, uh, you know, congratulations on getting out of those two, those two problems. I'm glad that didn't cause a real concern, but you're right. We all have to be very careful. Um, you know, shipping um, challenge, rising raw material, um, you know, lots of things going on that are really seem to be poised at least to drive prices uh, higher. We've got new, some, some new COVID lockdowns in, uh, in China. Um, you know, what are you experiencing at Sanmar and, and how does that link into your inventory planning as well? Yeah, I mean, very significantly challenged. I mean, you certainly saw with the with how much e-commerce grew this year that all of the parcel carriers in the United States were were significantly challenged. Their their networks um, were completely overwhelmed, 
And, and so they went through, we were really fortunate that they didn't, but they went through to many of their customers. UPS did this to even some of their largest customers and basically put caps on what they could ship. It was like, you get 10,000 packages today. You don't get to then 10,001. And there were real penalties if you shipped more. Um, they, they were late. They didn't ship on time. It was, uh, we've had a fantastic relationship with UPS. It's gone back, you know, a long time. We were really fortunate that they didn't put caps on our business, but it was really, uh, we were still really challenged. Um, ocean freight and ocean containers are at a huge premium today. The world is just very out of balance is the way I kind of think about it. These like global supply chains that exist are very, um, uh, you know, so precise in how everything kind of moves and COVID threw everything out of balance. And so you have things like Brexit, which which attracted a huge amount of kind of like pre-inventory ahead of that into the UK. So you went all of these shipping containers went into the UK ahead of Brexit and they've been slow to come back. You have all these retailers in the United States who stopped you know, buying and then are in this huge restocking process. So you have this huge amount of restocking that's happening, that's creating giant demand and, and congestion at West Coast ports. Meanwhile, you have dead ports in Asia because they don't have shipping containers. So the shipping lines are just skipping these ports because they don't have anything, they, they don't have any containers there. That, that the level of balance is there. We go out and we contract a rate with our um, ocean ocean lines, and you basically get a, a, a rate per container and you commit to a certain amount of container volume that you're going to do through the year. And then you don't get to 100% of what you think because you don't know what that real number is. So you traditionally go into the spot market and you buy containers and it's a little bit of a higher price, but it's not a huge difference. Today, that spot rate for containers might be five to six times what our contracted rate is. And so if you're a shipping line and you can get um, somebody's spot container on your ship or San Mars contracted container on your ship at 20% of the price, you know, who are you going to take? So we're really working hard those relationships to try to make sure that our containers get on ships. And when we have to go out and buy in the spot market, we're paying a lot more per container. So it's exceptionally, uh, you know, challenging today. And then we're certainly seeing raw material prices increase, especially with cotton and, 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 you know, there's a lot of reasons. Cotton is always driven by a few things. It is a agriculture crop, so it depends on um, you know how people have planted and what they think the expected crop is going to be. Um, it's a global crop, so it's grown in you know lots of places. And then you have seen you know over time, you know India might limit the amount of cotton that they export, or the United States might limit cotton. That, you know today with um, everything that's happening in China, where basically China cotton has come off the world market, or at least from the United States, that's driven up prices. So you have a lot of factors that go into um, uh, pricing, and and I would expect that that's going to flow through into our products and into pricing in the image industry this year. Yeah, you, know, you mentioned China. What you know for for several years now, because of, of tariff concerns early on in, in the. In the prior administration and then the actual tariffs that were put in place across the board promotional products suppliers have been looking for alternative sources of product outside of china for hard goods and for apparel so what's your supply chain look like and how heavily uh, invested are you uh, in terms of sourcing in china or are you mostly in the caribbean sort of you know are you feeling really good about the diversity of, of your sourcing so i feel good about the diversity it just means you have a lot more problems sometimes too <laughs> You know, we're in over 20 countries today and we made a huge effort to move out of China because mostly because of the tariffs that that had really accelerated an effort that was occurring in apparel production mm -hmm. um, as China moved kind of up the value chain was producing higher value items. Uh, you know, apparel was moving already to countries. So we're heavily invested in in Africa, in kind of the India, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, in Central America. Um, but we do a lot in Asia and, and a lot in a fair amount in China and in Vietnam. And so we were moving a lot out of China. Um, and so today we don't do a ton of production in China. But as you think about it as a, you know, fiber that is grown, that is kind of traded, even if you're not making your shirt in China, first off, you may have a supply chain that says, well, I'm using China cotton. So you may be making a shirt in Vietnam that uses China cotton or that uses China fabric. Um, 
and, and or you may not have a China supply chain at all, but when you take that much cotton kind of out of the market, it still has an inflationary effect on other cotton that exists. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a great example. We do a fair amount of production in India and a lot of people were moving from China to India. So if you're a cotton grower or a yarn spinner in India, your prices are going up because the demand is huge. And so um, you may not make anything in China, you may make it all in India, your prices are still uh, going up. But again, we're in so many countries, they all have different kind of challenges. I think for us though, certainly, you know, forced labor is a, is a uh, you know, a red line that we just, absolutely won't cross and won't work with. And so, you know, we've done a really good, I think a good job, but it's been a lot of hard work to actually really map your supply chain all the way back to make sure that we aren't using, you know, China cotton kind of in our products. That's not as easy as it sounds. The, the apparel supply chain is pretty opaque. So traditionally you might work with a garment manufacturer who's really a, does cut and sew. Mm -hmm. They're buying from a textile company who, who makes the fabric, who buys from a yarn spinner, who makes the yarn, who buys from a, you know, a ginner who buys from a field, right? And so, you know, understanding your supply chain all the way back to the source um, is not as easy, uh, you know, as it sounds. And so we worked really hard to try to do that with our supply chain to make sure that we're not using any forced labor um, in any of our products. Well, I speak for everybody that, you know, I, I really appreciate that because that that U.S. ban on cotton out of certain regions of China because of that forced labor is, is you know, an incredible story. And I'm glad that we've done that. Uh, we've got a lot of great questions uh, from from uh, from our viewers here. Uh, let me just sort of uh, pop in and, and try to take a few of them in the next five or six minutes we have. Um, question from Jeremy. I've noticed that a lot of blank suppliers are acquiring decoration and distributor businesses. Is that something that Samar will get into in the future? So you know, we have never wanted to be in the decoration business. We, we are really good, I think, at what we do. You know, we take an order, we put it into a box, we ship that box the same day. Um, at, you know, we have a lot of our customers are decorators, but it's it's not so much that we don't want, it, it, we don't want to compete with our customers, but we don't think it's what we're really good at. And so there are really hundreds and more of great decorators and contract decorators across the country. And so our real focus is on how do we make it as easy as possible for a distributor to buy from a blank supplier like us and use um, one of the great contract decorators that exists. And so, you know, we've spent a lot of energy building our uh, PSST network um, and to really try to bring value. And I think our next big shift is how do we use technology to make that uh, even barriers kind of go away. And so it's not about Sanmar owning decoration. It's about Sanmar enabling the process of de buying decorated apparel becoming much easier. And that's a huge focus of what we want to do. So is that about reducing the number of invoices and, and availability of product to a, to a decorator? Is it something in, in that way? I, I, that's a huge part of it. I mean, the idea that the number of invoices that somebody has to pay is a piece of it, but there's also a lot of friction around just how do I communicate? How do I, you know, do every piece of that uh, that transaction and and using the three parties? And so um, there's a lot that we still need to work on there. We don't have all the answers, but that is that that is our vision of kind of where the industry goes. So another question from uh, Jamie: uh, With all the work at home that people are doing, what are the, some of the new trends you might see in in product uh, going out uh, in the next year or so? And as you're planning the kinds of products you're going to be offering. You know, what, what are really the changes in product and styles that you're that you're thinking about? You know, certainly, uh, you know, it's it's really interesting because it's what's done well from us and then and then what's, you know, going to do well. Um, you know, we've done really well with everything that you think of in terms of kind of athleisure, you know, our fleece business or, you know, anything that's comfortable and cozy and that you want to wear at home. I mean, all of those products have done exceptionally well. We are, we are completely sold out of blankets. I mean, that was the gift of the year was the blanket, because if you want to sit outside and, you know, socially distance with your friends, you know, having a blanket was a great piece. I, I got, um, I got multiple blankets as gifts from, you know, businesses that I, that I associate with. So those things are great. We think blankets will be a great gift again next year. We just don't think it's going to be as, as the gift of the year, the way it really was kind of this year. Um, we think sports is going to come back uh, really quickly for all the reasons that I talked about kind of before. I think we we believe corporate travel and corporate gifting comes back, but at a slower 
kind of pace. And I think that's going to be an interesting thing to watch. You know, we've done now two national sales meetings um, at Sanmar over Zoom, and they're not nearly as good as they are in person, but they're also free to put on, you know, and it costs a lot when we bring our entire sales team back together. And so, you know, I see the future going forward. We'll do some combination of virtual and and, and in person. And, um, you know, so we're, I am, I'm less bullish on some of our, you know, higher end corporate apparel um, coming back kind of faster. And I still think a lot of that, I, I think this year is going to really be around flexibility of work and people as they go back, um, you know, how we all work sometime. Our, our vision, at least at Sanmar, is that it's not that everybody continues to work at home forever. We absolutely all want to be back in the office, but we see a future where people, there's going to be more flexibility in work than that people are going to be able to work from home some days and be in the office some days. And so, you know, apparel and things that support that is going to be interesting. I, I was having a conversation with somebody too. I, we were on the phone with a, uh, I won't name the company, but it's like a Wall Street bank. I mean, this is like a, you know, big bank. And the guy is who I'm on the call with, I kind of dressed up for the call, at least dressed up for COVID. And he's wearing a t-shirt and he looked like he hadn't showered, you know, that day and, and uh, messy hair. And it was just kind of like, you know, when we, you know, at Sanmar's offices were corporate casual kind of before. I mean, I could wear a polo shirt or a woven like this, but I really wouldn't have worn a t-shirt to the office. You know, I've worn a t-shirt most days during COVID, you know, and it'll be interesting to see how some of these trends kind of continue. So, you know, our polo business is not a growing business, but our t-shirt business and some of those casual pieces continue to grow. And we think that that'll can continue to transition to better tees. So if you look at like the all made tees that we brought in this year, it's a, it's a tri blend. It's a, uh, you know, there's an eco uh, and social responsibility story. It fits great. So, I mean, I think those types of products are going to continue to do really well. Uh, as that becomes a more acceptable piece of uh, work, you're going to want your better T-shirt. So, yeah, that's great. A better T-shirt. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got a few questions here about something that, um, you know, there, people are asking about offering FedEx Express pickup at local FedEx locations. Uh, and, you know, I, I know what I just read to you. So we've had a couple of people ask about that. So can you can you comment on any of that? So I know um, some of our competitors offer a service where you can uh, pick up at a FedEx Kinko's location, and I believe it's free freight. And and um, we, you know, we've looked at that. We we do not have that on our roadmap today. as something that we want to offer. We actually are. We went live last night, so this is a. And, and I probably shouldn't say this because we're in like kind of beta testing of using. Um, basically, it's a UPS service where they put your product into the mail stream. So the USPS does the final leg of the delivery. Um, and it allows us to offer, um, it's it's a longer time. It is a, um, and it's not a guaranteed time. So maybe today, UPS next day is, you know, uh, it's next day guaranteed. This might be two to three days delivery, but it's a lot less expensive as a shipping method. And so the challenge that we have is our, is how do we ship small quantities kind of effectively and affordably and that is a challenge for sanmar it's a challenge for the industry and and so um this thing called mail innovations that we're that we've just launched we think is going to be a step in really helping to uh, bring down the cost of if you need one shirt sent to you what does that look like especially if you can wait a couple of days great and someone uh, is uh, familiar with with amazon's b2b uh program and they're wondering if if you've looked at selling through the Amazon B2B program and, and if there's any possibility of that for, for cinema. You know, it's not something that we've really spent time looking at. We have, um, we certainly have customers who sell on Amazon and sell kind of our product, um, you, you know, direct, but we really haven't looked at, um, you know, whether we could put our products there and it could be part of their prime program and they could be part of their kind of business. Uh, but I definitely think it's things, you know, um, I, last year I was in Atlanta and I was visiting UPS and, you know, they are their biggest customer is Amazon and their biggest competitor is Amazon, you know, and that's an interesting place to be if you're UPS, but it's a, um, you know, I think you have to look at them for kind of, you know, how they do delivery and some of those things. And then I think at the same time, it, it, you know, I look at it potentially as being competitive to our business and our, you know, we've invested a lot in our distribution network and everything that we do. And so, um, you know, I think we we 
uh, always uh, look at them warily because we know how great of a competitor they are in every business that they get into. Um, and so, you know, but that doesn't mean that there's not opportunities to partner with them on things. Well, thank you so much. This has been awesome. Um, you know, I think people really enjoy it. We had a lot of great feedback in the chat. Uh, thanks very much, Jeremy, for joining us. Congratulations on a great year in 2020 and your service to the industry and, and really to the nation. You know, I think the turning around 250 million masks to help us stay safe is a really incredible thing to have done. And so thank you and your other pure companies in the apparel co uh, world for doing that for us. And uh, I look forward to actually being able to see you in Chicago in July. Yeah, thank, thanks to my, I, I, I really, I can't wait till we're all there. I, I miss all my industry friends and seeing everybody. And, and just, again, thanks for having me and, and I appreciate it very much. So look forward to seeing you all soon. Okay, take care, thank you. Thanks everybody.